The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. I told you, I think the last class before we took the break, of a story about this orphanage. I don't know if you remember the story. I'm going to repeat it quickly because there's an epilogue. This man came to me, a rabbi came to me at the end of the class one day, maybe a month ago. And he comes over to me and says, I have an orphanage in Israel. I want you to, come, I want you to, I want you to know that. I said, well, what are you talking to me for? He says, I'm your rabbi in the community. I want you to know that. Okay. And he starts, he pulls out a little iPad. He shows me some videos, some little things. And the girls, it's all girls. There's 400 girls in three different buildings. Ashkenazi, Sfaradi. And the stories are like gut-wrenching. Parents who passed away in terrorist attacks. Father sick. Mother's not okay. He shows me a video of a father coming in with two, two girls. And you see him bringing in the suitcases into the lobby. And he has like a mask on his mouth. He says, you see this man? He lost his wife. And six weeks after this video, he passed away. And these two girls are in our orphanage. And then he tells me this story. And I told it to you last time. I said it was London. It was actually Antwerp. He says, there was this man. I went to Antwerp. And I'm meeting this fellow. And then I go over to him, a wealthy man, and ask him for some money. He starts yelling at me. Yelling at me, yelling. You're a joke. You're a fraud. You don't even have an organization. There's no such thing like this today. You're making the whole thing up. 400 girls without parents broke. What are you talking about? He says, I said, no, no, it's true. He says, ah, it's a joke. And he kicked me out of his office. Well, that year is around Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur time. I'm walking in Rushalayim and I see this man. I see him. And I go over to him and I got nothing to lose. I go over to him and I say, oh, sir, I just want you to know. You remember what you said to me? He says, yeah, I do. Well, good. I don't forgive you. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur is coming. You're not forgiven. The man says, you can't say that. He says, yes, I can. I don't forgive you. Come and see it. He says, I don't have time to see it. I'm leaving tomorrow. He says, okay, you're not forgiven. You go and greet Rosh Hashanah your own yourself. I don't forgive you. So, that night about 1 o'clock in the morning, the rabbi gets a phone call. It's this guy from Antwerp. He says, I'm leaving tomorrow morning. I feel too guilty. I got to come. He says, it's 1 a.m. How am you coming? He says, I just got to come. He says, okay, I'll figure it out. He comes, he says, I'll bring you to the building with the younger girls. You, you could peek into their rooms. He comes at 1.45, he comes into the building, and he peeks into the rooms, and he sees these little girls sleeping soundly, eight years old, seven years old, six years old. And then he sees older girls, like, running up and down the steps, and he says, what's this? He says, oh, these are the girls that are taking care of them. You see, if a girl wakes up in the middle of the night, and she starts crying, it causes, like, an epidemic, where the next one cries, the next one cries, because they all have sad stories. So they get her a glass of water and they watch them. This guy from Antwerp says, I never saw anything like this in my life. He says, this building is old. He says, get me the price of what it's going to cost to redo the entire building. The next day he got on the price and the man dedicated $750,000 to redo the whole thing. And a year later, when it was finally dedicated, the man got up at the dinner and he said, when the rabbi came to me for the first time, I yelled at him. You know why I yelled at him? I yelled at him because I said, can't be that there's such a thing today. And you know why also I yelled at him? Because when I was a little boy, my parents passed away. And no one loved me. And no one cared for me. I thought it's impossible that this can be. And when I saw it, I said, I have to dedicate something to this. Well, the rabbi is telling me this whole story in the back of the room. And he said, next time you come to Israel, I want you to come see it. I said, I'm not planning on going to Israel anytime soon. Okay, I'll try. Something happened. A week later, my wife and I decided to over winter vacation. We're going to go to Israel. My kids are, still have school. We're going to Israel. I said, if I decide I'm going to Israel, the man came to me a week before. I have to go visit this place. And I think, before I tell you about my visit, I think this is another explanation of Saok Yitzak. They will cry. It says double cry. Because you know what happens? When one cries, the other cries. And it causes like a ripple effect. Where now it's the pain, and that's what he was describing. One girl is feeling pain, the other one is down, the other one is down. And this is what happens when someone is down and some people are feeling that pain, and we're not caring about that pain. It starts to become, it starts to grow and build. So I'm in Israel, and it's on a Monday. I decide I'm going to go to this place. <coughs> what? No. It's, I'll tell you what it's called in a minute. It's called Bayit La, la Pletot. I'll give it to you in a minute. So I'm on the way. Before I go there, I'm going to visit this rabbi. This rabbi's name, one of the most famous advice rabbis in the entire Yerushalayim, his name is Rabbi Gamliel Rabinowitz. He lives in Geula. I'm going to go to this house. 
I come with my wife, we go into the rabbi's house, and I'm talking to him, asking him just different random advice things about community and about classes and speeches. And one of the things he tells me, he says, I will give a speech to anybody. He says, I'll give a speech to four people, I don't care. I said, really? He says, yeah, let me tell you why. He pulls out this little picture from the shelf. It's like a broken old picture. You know, it's like ancient black and white pictures. And he says, you see this man? This man is my father. My father, he lost his parents when he was eight years old. He lost his parents. See this little kid? That's me on his lap. He says, my father passed away at 96 years old. And by the time he passed away, he had 1,000 descendants. 1,000 grandchildren and great-grandchildren. A thousand. He said he saw his fifth generation. He saw his children. He saw his grandchildren. He saw his great-grandchildren. He saw his great-great-grandchildren. He said, so to me, one person is a thousand people. One orphan is a thousand people. So it's unbelievable meeting. And then I'm going to go. I'm on the way to the orphanage. And I walk into this building. And sure enough, on the building, they have the name of that person from Antwerp who dedicated it. And I went to the building, first of the older kids and then the younger kids. And you see these girls walking around and running around with smiles on their faces. And you see these people, these angels, who are like taking care of them. Some of them volunteer. Some of them are getting paid, but like Ka'an paid. And they're walking around and they have mothers who stay for hours, who watch. They have counselors who live in the rooms with these girls. And you see the girls walking around and they tell me, you know, some of them come where they have no parents, some are missing one parent, and some have parents and they still have to be here. And then I saw one set of parents walk into the building. And you see the parents like they're, they're just, I don't know, you ever see people in Yerushalayim who are just like they don't have it together? And, and that's where the parents, you're like, this is, they said there's once two girls talking and one girl said to the other, he says, you know, you're lucky that your parents passed away. He says, what are you talking about? He says, yeah, because i got to deal with my parents. My parents are alive. So I'm walking through this place, and I'm watching this whole scene, and each story is more gut-wrenching than the other, and I think I, I made it, uh, I can't think I got you depressed enough. But the place is gorgeous. Like, there's a toy room, they have computers, they play games, they're doing arts and crafts. The each girl has their room and has their, everything's orderly and organized. The Pasuk says, if you paid it, watched it closely, Hashem says, Lo ta'anun, don't pain them. Ki im ta'ane oto. Because if, im ane ta'ane oto, if you pain him. So some commentaries, the Cheskuni says, you just transition from saying, don't pain them, if you pain him. Why would you go from them to him? And the Cheskuni writes, he says, here's why. He says, because sometimes the orphan specifically doesn't even know the pain he's experiencing. And I, the Torah, the Pasuk wants to accentuate that child. The widow, she might know. The orphan doesn't even know doesn't know what he's feeling. He doesn't even know the pain he's feeling. So I walk into his place and these little girls and young girls and then I go to the younger place. Five, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. They don't even know what they're missing. And then they take me downstairs to this room. This is the clothing room. It's as organized as a department store. Every single shirt is folded exactly perfect. Exactly perfect, all piled perfectly. The cabinets are all structured exactly. And there's this woman who's like the neatest person you ever met in your life. And she's there and she says, here's the story. These girls come here, they don't have anything. Anything. So they walk into the building. They walk into the building, they don't have any clothing. So first we give them some used clothing, but they don't feel special in the used clothing. So we try to get people who like sponsor a specific girl... And they'll put away a little bit of money, and then we'll buy the girl like a new sweatshirt, a new sweater. She says, a girl came in today and says, I have no gloves. Another girl came in today, which she was going to wear like a pajama top in the freezing cold rain, because that's all she had to keep her warm. And I take her, and we buy some things. And we keep the girls in this building until they get married. And then she takes me to this closet, a glass closet, and you see hanging in the closet, 30 gowns. She says, the girls walk into this room 
and they wait for that moment. And they wait till that happens. And each girl gets this sponsor who takes care, who sends money just for the extras that this girl wants. I said, what do you mean each girl gets a sponsor? I said, yeah, each girl, the family sends a few dollars and to this girl. I said, you mean like I could sponsor a girl? She says, yeah. I said, you mean I could meet her right now? She says, yeah. I said, what does it mean? You send a few dollars every month. I mean, it's a little more. It's uh, money. And we put it away and we hold it for the girl. And the girl gets these things. By 15 minutes later, we were sponsoring 11-year-old Batya Tsubeli. Batya Tsubeli is a Svaradi girl. My wife, we met her. My wife gave her this big, huge hug. And I gave her 50 shekel just to start. It's just like, here, use it for yourself. And here's her story. You ready for her story? Batya was born on March 16, 2004. Chaf Gimal Adar, and has already seen much sadness in her young life. Badia's parents each had been married before. They remarried in the hope of rebuilding their lives and brought with them children from their previous marriages, which, make it, which made it difficult for everyone to adjust. Gradually, as time passed, Badia's half-siblings were beginning to adjust. But Mr. Sibeli was diagnosed with a fatal illness and passed away shortly afterwards. After much family pressure, Mr. Sibeli realized that for the best interest of his children, he has, he has to find a place that's secure, secure and loving environment for his daughter Batya. So Batya and her half-sisters were brought to this orphanage to get love and care. And now Batya Sibeli has the Habers to try to take care of her. And that's what we... And it was so amazing experience to see this little girl, and she's adorable, young little 11-year-old girl who's a month away from a bat mitzvah, and here we're talking to her, and we're interacting with her, and you see the kids, the hardest part is like they all want, oh, there's a sponsor here, we, can I get a sponsor, I want a sponsor, I want a sponsor, and I, I can't, I, I can barely afford one, I can't do seven, but... You see this little girl who now is going to get, and it's not really so much about the money. We're going to send her pictures. We're going to send her little gifts. We'll send her some candy. We'll send her letters. We'll call her every now and then. When, that's just periodically. Every time we go to Israel, we'll get a chance to go and visit her and let her get what every person needs. Love. Let her be able to fill that void. You know, there's this classic story of that rabbi from Brisk, Rabbi Chaim Brisco. He says he never used to use his title. He never said, I'm the rabbi or the head of the community. There was one time where there was a widow outside of the town who needed him, and he was walking, and he was already older, and he was one of the little kids. There was a younger person with him. He said, go run ahead and tell the widow that the rabbi of Brisk is coming to her house so that she should feel prestigious and important. So I figured... You know what, let me try this with this little girl. So I'm trying to make her feel like, you know, the Habers are a big deal. So I said, you know, we're American. She looks at me. I said, you know, we're from the Syrian community. She looks at me. I said, you know, I'm like a rabbi in the Syrian community. She looks at me. I said, you know, I give speeches and classes online. Looks at me. Then we're like walking by a room and we hear a little music. I said, you know, I am Yaakov Shweki's friend. <laughs> And wow, she lit up like a, wow, oh my goodness. I felt like, <laughs> the ability to take someone out of the scenery and give them what they so desperately need is an unbelievable feeling. I cannot tell you how rich we felt walking out of that building. I can't, I, I don't know how to describe it. It was the most unique experience I ever had in my life. But you don't have to go always to across the world to find someone. There's people sitting in the room. There's people on your block. There's people in your family. There's people in your children's class. There's people in your school who need that feeling and that experience of love. 
And once we get like happy and secure with our life and our income and what we have, the minute we feel that is the minute we become a little elitist. And the minute we become included in Lord Ta'anun, don't cause pain because so many of us in some not specific way cause some of that pain. I'm going here, I'm doing this, we spoke about it before we went away. I'm going away, I came back, I have a tan, look how great. This, you see a kid who's frustrated. You see a woman who's angry. You see someone who sometimes is not nice. Those people are begging for love, begging for it. And if you feel, if you don't feel that void, then that means Hashem made you capable of filling someone else's void. And even if you feel it sometimes, or you once felt it, you are sometimes so much the person who can give it to someone else. Science Saok Yitzak Eli, if they cry out to me, Hashem says, I'm listening. How about us? Are we listening? Are we paying attention to that person's pain? Are we noticing the people around us that are struggling and that are hurting and that have the void of love that they're missing at even only a stage of their life? Because so many of us are. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire dot org.